this episode of Colorado Springs the Way It Was, we look at the history of the Myron Stratton home through the memories of former resident John Zorak. The Myron Stratton home was created by Cripple Creek millionaire Winfield Scott Stratton to honor the memory of his father. Still operating today, the Myron Stratton home assists young people and the elderly who are indigent and in need. John Zorak moved to the home as a child during the 1930s. A distinguished alumnus, John went on to graduate from Colorado College and the DU Law School. He served for 20 years in the U.S. Marine Corps and eventually became a well-respected lobbyist in the Washington, D.C. area. John has written several books and was involved in the early lobby efforts on behalf of Federal Express to deregulate the air freight business. In his own words, John Zorak narrates this remarkable film on the Myron Stratton home. Shot in 1939 by the Alexander Film Company, this film was provided to us courtesy of Mark Turk of the Myron Stratton Home. Colorado Springs The Way It Was is produced by the Pikes Peak Library District and underwritten by the Alexander Film and Video Company, which has generously provided film to video transfer services for this series. Well, my father was a retired uh, injured coal miner and he had his chest crushed and uh, uh, had worked in the Pikeview coal mine, but didn't what wasn't injured there. But I, um, after my folks separated uh, because of his injury, uh, I spent a year at the day nursery, and then I spent uh, first, second, third, and fourth grade, <coughs> and fifth grade living with him. And he found out about the Myron Stratton home, and I was interviewed. Uh, in my little small shack, which my dad had built north of town, by David Strickler, then the lawyer for the Stratton home, and Lucy A. Lloyd, the superintendent. My dad and I were uh, being, both being interviewed. And uh, at that time, of course, I was uh, heading into sixth grade. And the home decided that uh, I would be uh, suitable to uh, matriculate as a student to Myron Stratton home. It was like the difference between black and white. I'll give you one example. When Miss Lloyd and Dave Strickler came out to see me, we had an outdoor privy. And this was in days when this was a, this is not in the early depression area, in the 30, late, early, uh, late 20s and early 30s. I was in charge of taking care of the, of our little outdoor outhouse and I had to lime it every day. And I was scared to death that, that my distinguished guests would have to go to the restroom because I had forgotten to lime the outhouse that day. And I went from that kind of an environment to the Myron Stratton home where we had indoor toilets, showers, uh, tubs, and it was just like moving from uh, uh, from uh, uh, a, a underprivileged environment to, the, let's say, the Broadmoor Hotel. <clears throat> well, initially, as I say, I was uh, the only son of an injured coal miner who really couldn't take care of me. And I was really, in essence, running wild, not that I was in a lot of trouble. But I could have gone that direction. And I think that uh, going to the home gave me order, discipline, the home gave me the opportunity to be a musician, gave me the opportunity to learn a violin, a trombone, and it also gave me, opened the door to sports because the home provided facilities for children to engage in sports. And beyond that, it really gave me the chance to live in an environment where I was working with and living with other boys and girls of the same age, a big family. And Living in that family environment was a tremendous stepping stone for the service. So going into the service was no problem. It was no problem even going to college and living in a dormitory because I was used to living with people. I was used to discipline. I was used to having to study every night. And that really was a, a stepping stone for college and, of course, my military career. Well, I've done uh, uh, some research on, uh, of course, on Winfield Scott Stratton, 
But what I think I particularly admire in him and in many people is the his persistence. I think that that epitomizes uh, many people who have ex gone on to great success, but Stratton, over 18 years, had the persistence to follow a goal and the patience to follow through. And I think without persistence and the patience, I don't think even the most uh, uh, gifted people will not succeed. You have, you have gifted uh, great intellects that walk the streets today, but with, that, that haven't had the persistence to follow through with God's gifts. So I think that we're looking back at Stratton, God, I wish I'd have known him, but he, I think that people don't understand the, the talk that maybe he was a, a loner and a recluse and maybe he drank too much, but the, here was a man who was a bright man who went on and he had the persistence even in all those years of, uh, of uh, hardship going out alone in the, in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains and all these peaks that here, f trying to find gold. He took courses at Colorado College to try to better his educa education and to further his knowledge of mining. So he wasn't just a dumb prospector. He was bright and able. But again, it was, what comes through is that persistence and that ability to follow through on a dream that he had and he eventually became a reality when he found the Independence Mine at Cripple Creek. He didn't take that money and I said, and build a palace like the Versailles in Paris, like someone said that he might do. He didn't, he lived very simply and frugally, really a model for, I think, all of us. You know, money can buy a lot of things, you know, that we might enjoy, but he enjoyed giving back to this community in which he lived. And it wasn't, it was the community, he gave them buildings, the post office, land, he gave churches, very all churches, very quietly money. He gave the Salvation Army money. He was a man who, th who thought much about his fellow man. And I talk about you know, humanitarianism. There is no doubt in my mind, until I'm proven different, until it's proven differently, that this man is no doubt Colorado's greatest humanitarian in a time when he had everything, when he could give his money to uh, endow it to all kinds of great institutions, he gave it to the people, to the people in this city, and he endowed a home so that pe the children and elderly, ch elderly people could be taken care of. And this meant more to him than living in, a, say, a grand, a grand palace or having all the great trappings of, that, that wealth could buy. He didn't need that, and this says a lot. So if we could have probably talked to Stratton, he'd say, you know, my gift was a gift of humanity. This film is dedicated to Winfield Scott Stratton, Colorado's greatest humanitarian. He was born in Jeffersonville, Indiana, July 22nd, 1848, and died in Colorado Springs, September 14th, 1902. Stratton's greatest legacy was endowing the Myron Stratton home for the needy and poor, and every Founder's Day, many gathered to commemorate the life and good deeds of Stratton. On July 4, 1892, Stratton's dream of finding gold became a reality. After 17 years of persistent toil, he staked a claim on the Independence Mine. and his absolute refusal to be discouraged by repeated failures, aided by a thorough study of the mining business, careful preparation, courage, intelligence, and hard work made him a multi-millionaire. This old 16 millimeter movie footage you see was commissioned by David Strickler in 1939 and shows the Myron Stratton home when it was one of the most popular and beautiful places to visit in the Pikes Peak region.
And this film was probably made by the Alexander Film Company for the Myron Stratton home under the leadership at that time of William Lloyd and David Strickler. For many years, the Myron Stratton home was awarded first place for institutional grounds by the Colorado Springs Garden Club until, in a spirit of good sportsmanship, the trustees withdrew the grounds from competition. The beautiful grounds included flower beds, walks, ponds, rock gardens, and a small rock garden with cactus specimens. We lived in an environmental wonderland. A gravity irrigation system provided water for almost all the grounds and lush growth kept young boys and girls busy mowing, trimming, and digging dandelions. As one former resident said, the home has grown in beauty and graciousness through the efforts of those whose hands and hearts have guided it through these troublesome years. And if they have succeeded so marvelously with wood and stone, grass and flowers, what have they not been able to accomplish with the human lives entrusted to them? Almost every weekend, the ground was, grounds were visited by many, many people from Colorado Springs. These early trustees of the Myron Stratton home made certain that the intent of Winfield Scott Stratton was carried out and fulfilled. The duck pond, as you see here, was a popular place for young and old, with young children catching bluegill and frogs lurking under large green water lily leaves. were responsible for maintaining these beautiful grounds. And the girls had their chores, housekeeping chores inside and outside. They were busy digging dandelions by the bushel full. And this old tree-lined swimming hole at the west end of the gardens was replaced in 1937 with a beautiful modern pool, over 100 foot long, with, with a wading pool and three diving boards conveniently located between Washington and Independence Halls. The pool was heavily utilized and children received instructions in swimming and diving and they passed their junior and senior life-saving tests here. The pool's opening, opening every summer, was a great event. Girls did not participate in the overall ground maintenance, but they did participate in, in sports at the uh, Stratton home. We had a gym, indoor gym, and an outdoor athletic field. trustees in a 20, 1923 resolution said the ground shrubbery and flower beds and lawns should have careful adequate attention 
in other ways maintained so that it could be in appearance and reality a beautiful and fitting memorial to both the father Myron Stratton and the son William Scott Stratton. The children at the home helped do this. So life wasn't always sports. We did our chores and maintained the grounds. And when winter came at the Myron Stratton home, our spacious grounds and the shrubbery and trees became a winter wonderland with children building snow figures and sledding on hillsides. But winter was also special since Christmas was not far away and everyone looked forward to shopping downtown. At Perkins and Shearer where everyone selected three articles of clothing including a suit for the boys and dress for the girls. And Stratton said in his will, it is my special desire and command that the inmates of said home shall not be clothed and fed as paupers usually are at public expense, but that they shall be decently and comfortably clothed as we were. What a thrill to have nice clothes. What great expectations we had waiting to open gifts at Christmas. Having almost forgotten the color of a suit or dress, with the trustees and our matrons helping to distribute the gifts, listening to our Christmas carols and sharing our joy. We sang Christmas carols for the elderly residents at the home and those in the infirmary. The spirit of Winfield Scott Stratton was surely present in the widespread Christmas joy and happy faces of his beneficiaries. trustees at the home were not isolated. They became really part of our extended family, appearing at every possible event that the home was involved in, the home children, and also, of course, taking part in the distribution of presents at Christmas time. That's Lucy A. Lloyd just coming around the corner. Brilliant administrator and daughter of William Lloyd and superintendent of the home for so many years. She lived on the grounds in a home especially built for the superintendent. This picture was taken at Logan Hall where the older girls were quartered. Many of the girls were musicians in addition to singing. They took music lessons provided by the Myron Stratton home. And this is course at Logan Hall where the boys weren't allowed to go unless it was a special occasion where we were, quote, invited.
Part of the chores, of course, were keeping living quarters spotless and squared away. The women's quarters at Washington and Logan buildings reflected individuality and, of course, pride. Every Saturday was a overall clean-up day, especially in the morning, washing windows and cleaning our rooms. Independence Hall and Washington Hall were similar buildings. Of course, one for the young girls and one for the young boys. Independence Hall is where I first had a residence, the Myron Stratton home. And this again shows the dormitory style living and the young children getting into bed. And once into bed with lights out, we said the Lord's Prayer together. And going into the Marine Corps in later years, I never had a problem making a bed since I learned quite early at the Myron Stratton home. <clears throat> Graduating to Lincoln Hall meant individual cubicles for everyone, although Independence Hall had 10 cubicles in one end of the building. The transition to Lincoln Hall, however, meant more freedom along with more responsibility. When it came to work and study, and as we prog progressed through the high school and opportunities, we received help from our, our older brothers. We learned to operate as a family, help one another, fighting with one another, and learning to respect another's per, another person's individuality. We ate together, worked together, studied together, played together enjoying a camaraderie few had ever experienced. We truly became brothers and sisters. Again, these cubicles were ship shape. We cleaned them, we waxed the floors, we waxed the mirrors on our dresser, and every morning at 6.30, we, we washed the floors of the halls. We played together at the gymnasium, and we watched movies, Friday nights. In the auditorium, just next to the gymnasium. Every Friday night was movie night. We watched Shirley Temple. Charlie Chaplin and other movie stars of that era. And we also gave orchestra concerts. The elderly also lived there in cottages at the home. And we enjoyed their friendship and listened to their stories very often while working around these cottages, mowing the grass and trimming shrubbery.
Myron Stratton Home had its own infirmary for the aged and also for children who had different ailments. And the infirmary was located very close to these cottages for the elderly. came from all walks of life, including, including, including a concert piano player that I became well acquainted with. This is the infirmary, and many of us spent some time there getting our having our appendix removed or our tonsils, and again enjoying the company of the elderly residents. This power plant <clears throat> was built in 1924, making the home self-sufficient with regard to power, but this area was off limits. But children were occasionally provided special tours, and some boys occasionally tried to figure out how to access the over 1,000 feet of tunnels connecting the power plant to different buildings around the Stratton home. We never succeeded. Trustees deemed an, an independent and adequate water supply essential. In order to obtain such a supply, the entire real estate holdings of the Broadmoor Land and Water Company were acquired. Reservoirs and holding tanks were built, and in 1926 the trustees purchased the Brookside Water Company and its water rights and system guaranteeing an adequate water supply, including a surplus. The reservoirs were also off limits to young boys at the home who were permitted to hike thousands of acres owned by the home. fished and occasionally went swimming. See the Stratton grounds in the background, Stratton home. In nineteen thirty nine, uh, William Lloyd wrote. The home owns 5,000 acres of suburban land and farmland immediately south of Colorado Springs, with the home constituting 98 acres situated practically in the center of this estate. Thus, the home controls all property adjoining its site and is protected from any undesirable developments. 
For many years, it was the intention of the trustees to make the Myron Stratton home a model in cultivation, stock breeding, and efficient management, and that through its activities, it could build up the community. In 1933, the home's dairy herd set a national record for butterfat production. The home consistently produced outstanding crops with yields, as reported, difficult to duplicate outside of the Mississippi Valley. And the Stratton home had over 350 Hereford cattle. Stratton farms produced abundant crops, utilizing water from their Stratton storage reservoirs and irrigation ditches. The farm also had over 100 mules and horses, and a trip to the Stratton farm to watch the harvesting of crops was part of the young boys' recreation and education. Our education at the time this film was shot was under the supervision of Dr. Lloyd Shaw, principal of Cheyenne Mountain High School, where we received an outstanding education. We went to the elementary school in Ivy Wild. And this is a picture of the children getting off of our Stratton home bus going to the elementary school. And the Cheyenne Mountain High School with Dr. Lloyd Shaw as superintendent. We were taken to the school by our, again by our Stratton home buses where we went from the seventh grade until twelfth grade. And this is a picture of the Stratton Home Orchestra, which was the main nucleus for the Myron Stratton Home Orchestra and the Cheyenne Mountain School Orchestra. These are pictures of a concert at the Myron Stratton Home with our orchestra directed by Fred Fink. Stratton graduates were well prepared for service life and served their country with distinction and honor. A liberty ship in August of 1943 was christened the Winfield Scott Stratton and in honor of a Winfield Scott Stratton graduate, this is Lloyd Floyd Lindstrom who received the Congressional Medal of Honor in World War II. And our Stratton home cabin back of Cheyenne Mountain, where we spent weekends and occasionally weeks in the summertime. And on Memorial Day, Stratton home children went out to the Evergreen Cemetery where former residents of the Myron Stratton home were buried in land provided by Winfield Scott Stratton. And for years, the children of the Myron Stratton home placed wreaths on graves of people from the Myron Stratton home. President William Lloyd in 1936 said, speaking for the trustees and others said, we tried to make of the Myron Stratton home a real home insofar as this is possible. Thus and only thus can we establish and maintain a memorial worthy of its founder, Winfield Scott Stratton. It was clearly the purpose 
of Stratton and the trustee to maintain the Myron Stratton home as a home, not an institution, a real home in which the aged would be cared for and youth encouraged. And those blessed by the legacy of Winfield Scott Stratton are truly grateful for what we received.